you know, is uh, you know, is is a great check that out. Is is a great a great moment for me, you know, and and I show this not not to not to impress people, but to impress on them that you know, even later in life, however old you are, and you want to achieve, you know, certain things yeah. in life, that um, if it's been done before, then just do what's been done, but just do it better. Just do it better. So we're here today with Mark Colburn. Uh, he is an MBE. He's a Paralympian, and let's see him in action before we get started. No trouble with the gate this time. Marks away, pushing it this first corner, starting to get over the top of the gear. No problems whatsoever getting away for the, this time. 12 laps of the track, and as we watch the final get underway, for the record, the bronze has just been won while we were talking by Rodrigo Lopez of Argentina, who has got the bronze. Now, let's see who gets the goal here. And what's the lights that gives you the guidance here as we start? Coburn is down by 1.1 on the start. Now, we know that Mark has a, has a slow start. That's not part of his style, and he'll start to wind it up now, hopefully. Just making sure that Leandro is not going to try and go for the catch. You know, he's quite quick, so he could actually try and chase him, but... I don't think there's any trouble about the moment, he's holding out on him. The great danger of having such a wonderful audience is you to react to the audience rather than ride to your schedule or the man on the other side of the track and you sell out before the last kilometre. Now, this is a good sign, in my opinion, that Mark has got off the mark a little bit slower. Yeah, he's been called forward by his coach. Just dragging him a bit forward, just telling him he's a little bit behind schedules and he needs to pick up a little bit. Still, it's the Chinese rider reaching the opposite side of the track first. It's 1.181 the deficit now as we go through the first kilometre. And the first kilometre time, 117.611. They're not a particularly fast opening kilometre here. Yeah, Li Yangzhou is definitely up on where he was this morning. to be quite interesting to see how much quicker he's going to go. And Coburn is coming back, and as always, this incredible crowd spots it before I do. He's now inside a second, he's down nearly half a second. The steamroller is in progress. As you know, Mark's a good time trialist on the road as well, so he'll know what to do here. If anybody can actually lift this second part, Mark can do it. Here we go, as he closes in now, they're almost locked on the opposite sides of the track. Mark's cool. Right, cheers, Mark. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. It's, uh, well, it's definitely my pleasure having you here. Uh, I've seen your story online, and to be honest, it just gripped me from the off. Um, so I just want to get into it with you, really, and, and just have a chat. And uh, So what, what are you doing with yourself these days, Mark? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, obviously, thank you. You know, to uh, to everybody that's invited me along. You know, this wonderful part of of God's country here in South Wales. It's lovely. You know, in the UK. So, yeah, I, I guess for me, you know, the journey since you know since I had my accident in two thousand and nine has just been just crazy, man. Yeah. You know, just been crazy. I suppose I was very lucky to survive. You know, first and foremost, um, and as obviously the audience has probably watched, you know, the the first half of the race, um, that that was just a childhood dream. Oh, you know, I, I could just, only imagine. Just out, you know. So, so yeah, born and bred in South Wales. You know, for people that obviously maybe don't know where where South Wales is. You yeah. Know, in the, in the UK, uh, born and bred. You know, um, born in nineteen sixty nine. So, I was very privileged to, I suppose, have an incredible upbringing. You know, in the seventies, when it was really strange because we tended to have exceptionally long summers. Yeah. It was really weird. The summer would start. You know, sort of beginning of June and would run all the way till the end of September, you know, whereas now we get three days of sunshine and we think that was summer, you know. <laughs> seem, seem to have an April summer these days, don't we? Or Yeah, yeah, very true. Very, very true. So, uh, so yeah, so thanks for inviting me along. Really appreciate it. No, thank it. you. Honestly, it's a, it, it is a pleasure to be sat with you, as I, as I said before, and uh, you, your story is inspiring to so many people. Um, coming, coming back from, well, tragedy, really, uh, I don't know if you want to delve into what happened. Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, growing up in the 70s and the 80s um, it was a great time because the one thing I was definitely um, a big advocate of um, was sport, you know, health and well-being. 
Um, I've never really drunk much alcohol, even though I don't drink alcohol these days. You know, I've, I've stopped for personal reasons, health reasons. But, you know, growing up as a teenager, whereas uh, I suppose a lot of my friends would, you know, I suppose end up in the pub and on the yeah. Saturday afternoon I would be out playing my third or fourth game of football. Brilliant. You know? um, and, and just always enjoyed the, the feeling of movement, the benefit of being healthy, you know, as a, as a young kid. And uh, and certainly then as a teenager, almost, yeah, almost just really enjoying all different types of sport, whether it was your general football and rugby and cricket and swimming. And, um, you know, when I went to college, I even played hockey. Yeah. Of all sports, but same again, just, just loved it, you know. So I think, you know, for people watching this, um, maybe who don't participate in any kind of exercise, and then they wonder, well, you know, why am I so tired all the time? Why am I run down and why is my immune system shot? Well, you know, the old analogy is your body was made to move. You know, sure. it, was made, it was made to move. So it's so important for people to, you know, obviously understand and realize um, how to get the best out of, you know, well-being. So it's obviously good food, hydration and movement exercise you know yeah so so yeah i i guess you know my my uh, upbringing you know was was a great upbringing great parents you know my mother margaret's the wise owl she's still alive um unfortunately my dad passed away in 2012 so he never saw me you know go to the the paralympics um so that was really sad you know, oh, to, I mean, to uh, lose my dad but um but yeah great upbringing you know wonderful time in in college you know, obviously, I studied sports science in, in Cross Keys College. I uh, went to college when I was 19. Played volleyball for Wales, you know. Well, that was something I was going to ask you about, actually, <laughs> because I've watched yeah. a fair bit of your stuff and no one's ever brought it up, but yeah. that was one of the questions I was going to ask. The, How the, did you get into the... It, it was great because, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed, as I said, all different types of sport, okay? Um, and then one day, a, a friend of mine just said, well, you know, we, we're playing volleyball in the local club. Do you want to come along? I was like, yeah, I'll give it a go. Yeah, it looks like fun, and uh, and literally within eighteen months, I was playing volleyball for Wales. You know, God. which is mad. And then I had a British, a British volleyball trial in nineteen ninety in Lillishaw, which is the Olympic training camp up in Shropshire. Um, and I turned up. I'll never forget. <laughs> I turned up, and and I'm six foot one, and I've been six foot one for you know a, a long time. You know, probably thirty years, and um, and I turned up, and I was the shortest there. Yeah. I just in this like room full of giants, you know. So role reversal. Oh man, honestly, it was a great experience. You know, really enjoyed it. Um, you know, sort of three or four years playing with the Welsh team, and it was brilliant. I loved it. British finals and playing, you know, outdoor tournaments, and yeah, it was a it was a great time, great experience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You, you did a bit. Of, do you do a bit of triathlon as well, Mark? Is that yeah? That was later on. So you know, from excuse me, from when I was you know twenty. I got married then when I was 21, um, married for, you know, sort of 14, 13, 14 years. Um, and then my ex-wife and I just decided to part company. You know, we just wanted different things out of life, I guess. And uh, and my daughter, you know, who was like 10, nearly 11 then, um, you know, it was, uh, it was sad to obviously not be with Jessica, you know. But, you know, I still see her, you know, obviously regularly. And we've obviously got a, a, a great, you know, father know daughter oh, cool, relationship yeah. which is which is brilliant um and then yeah when i was 30 what was i 34 35 started racing triathlon yeah just just combining i guess combining the the three sports you know you're swimming you're cycling and you're running and uh, and i don't mind sharing this you know quite openly i was i was a decent swimmer you know i was i was pretty good on the bike but the worst part for me was the running because i suppose at the time i was probably 12 stone or 78 kilos and uh, and then there were people I was racing against who were probably seven to ten kilos lighter than me. Yeah. So you know the body weight distribution um, advantage then you know obviously was uh, was lost. But yeah, I loved it, enjoyed it, raced for four or five years, and it was it was great fun. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I I've done a couple of smaller triathlons. I've never took part in uh, Ironman or anything like that. But I did Abergavenny yep. triathlon, which was uh, quite a difficult one and. I, I was about 100 kilos. Oh, Christ. <laughs> so uh, when, when you said they had seven or eight kilos, there's about 20 yeah. to 30. <laughs> I was probably the heaviest there. But, but yeah, I think so a lot of people who, um, who start triathlons, for instance, um, you know, they start on the sprint triathlon. Yeah. And it's a, it's a great taster for people to, 
go in and dabble and just you know just try it because whatever event you're going to enjoy doing whether it's a, a duathlon or a triathlon or whatever is ensuring that you put in the work yeah. put in the training because the people unfortunately who don't put in the work they suffer then they don't enjoy it but if you put the work in you know then uh, then obviously you can enjoy it you know yeah. um, i did a cup a couple of half iron men um, yeah, and and thankfully it was sunny. <laughs> I can't imagine doing it in Wales in uh, you know in sort of October or maybe uh, April when it's bloody freezing cold. You know. <laughs> yeah, I think the the Tenby one is pretty brutal. Even though it's September, I think the weather down there in September can can yeah. get pretty choppy. Yeah. I've got a few friends who've done um, you know the Wales um, Ironman, um, and yeah, they've said the same thing. It's brutal. Yeah, just brutal. You know, the one guy is ex special forces. And he said to me, it's probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. Yeah. You know, and he's a right tough cookie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You it's know? it's not an easy task to do. That's something I'd like to tick off the bucket list one day. Definitely. Got to do yeah, it. Yeah, for know, sure. You've got to do it because I think, you know, the, the life we have as human beings it is incredible. It's a gift, but it's very short lived. Yeah. I think, I think it's easy to take things for granted as well, isn't it? And just uh, 100%. Not, yep. not live your full potential or as everyone's saying these days live your best life in it yes there's nothing worse and i've met you know some incredible um old age pensioners you know in their 80s and it's very apparent that some people have regrets but they don't have time yeah because they've run out of time and then there's other people who've lived you know almost a a completely crazy life you know where they've parachuted you know for their 60th birthday and base jumped yeah. You know, um, and and they they live their you know their their lives now in their eighties with a smile on their face because they know they've achieved everything they wanted to, so they can you know live out their lives and then pass on without regret. Yeah, you know, and that's that's something that I've, I guess, I've instilled into myself now, to ensure that you know the next fifty years is going to be as fruitful as the last fifty years, and uh, and I'm not going to die with regret. You know because. And we'll come on to this later on, you know, when we speak about the epic um, summer of sport that was London 2012, is um, it is knowing that the legacy that I can leave behind is the legacy that I've created, you know, rather than just just allow life to happen. Yeah. Well, think of yourself as an artist. Think of yourself as painting your very best, you know, piece of artwork, because you're you're in control. You know, so to get to the end of my life and look back, yeah, I definitely don't want uh, any regrets, you know. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, it's powerful, man. It is, you know, it is. Welcome to life. <laughs> yeah, L live yeah. life without restrictions because I think most of the time is self-imposed. Yeah. I think everyone's got so much more potential than they, they give themselves, uh, give themselves, well, yeah, I think you could push so far past your, your boundaries. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the hardest thing for, you know, certainly for youngsters you know, um, is knowing what you want to do, okay? Because life is so fruitful these days, you know? Like, you you know, you can enjoy life in, in abundance, you know? Um, everything you want is there for you. You just got to find out how to get it, um, learn how to get it, who's done it before you, learn from them, and then learn the skills, apply the skills, and then obviously go and enjoy it, you know? And I think that's part and parcel of, you know, my journey to London 2012 is growing up, you know, as I said, in South Wales, Probably climbing every tree, probably <laughs> running and cycling over every mountain, just because I just I, I I just enjoyed the the feeling of movement, you know. So, so when I then you know I suppose moved from uh, triathlon, um, you know I was a keen rock climber, um, you know sort of what was I thirty five, thirty six, um, and then a friend of mine we spoke about paragliding one day. And uh, and this guy was a paragliding pilot, and I said, oh, I'd love to have a go at that. I'd love to have a go at that. That that, that must be amazing, because it's almost like the Peter Pan moment, <laughs> you know. As kids, you know, certainly I did when I was a kid. I I wanted to fly. It's a dream, you know? isn't it? It's just a dream, you know. And we all, I suppose, we all aspire for these crazy things, but maybe we just think, oh yeah, it's too dangerous, or maybe I shouldn't do it, or you know, other people who do do it are lucky because they've got the skills, but um, I'll never forget, you know, obviously joining the paragliding club and uh, and obviously then learning how to, you know, obviously fly this incredible piece of apparatus. Um, and, it, it, yeah, it just becomes an addiction. I bet it does, know? yeah. It just becomes a, a, a mild addiction, 
where the feeling, you know, is just when your feet leave the floor, it's just like, holy shit. Here <laughs> we go. Incredible, <laughs> you know? So, so yeah, so that was back in 2008. And, uh, and then obviously, you know, we can come on to the accident because I suppose that was the turning point, you know, in, uh, in history, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, blown me away to be honest with some of the things you say, Mark, it's, uh, it's amazing how positive you are. It's, it's great, and I think talking on sports, um, for kids these days, I don't know your thoughts and feelings, but I think they definitely need that extra push to get into them because it's so easy to get your, your dopamine hits off, yeah. off your phone, off a screen, yeah. off uh, what you're eating, whereas like, I think the, the real hits come from the natural movement, like you say. Most definitely, you know, and I, I've been very privileged to travel the world, and I've met some you know, incredible people you know some some really famous people you know some a-list celebrities and and they've all said the same thing you know they've had their career for instance and their career comes to an end and they're still a famous famous name you know but naturally you know they they tend to sort of go off the path of health and well-being but they soon come back onto it Mm. because if you ignore how you feel then you're not doing yourself justice no because you know it's important to feel positive before you think positive, you have to focus on those five pillars, you know, of, of health and well-being. And these famous people have all said the same thing. They go off the wagon, but they soon come back on because they don't want to feel literally like they've got a hangover, even though some of them don't even drink. Yeah. But it's just, you know, the unhealthy food, unhealthy lifestyle, lack of movement, you know, lack of movement. And I suppose, you know, we've just gone through, you know, the, the crazy summer of 2020, you know, with a global pandemic that's literally not only put, you know, 90% of the planet in the house, but in the house doing nothing, Yeah. you know? So for people who don't walk, you know, don't physically go out and do their morning walk or, you know, do some yoga or breathing exercises, you know, just go and do something. Yeah. Because the feeling your body gets, as you said, the dopamine dump, you know, when you, you get all those chemicals, the body wants more. Yeah. You know, well, I- in my experience, as I said, I, I don't drink alcohol now, but, you know, I went through a period in my life where I was r- not reliant on alcohol for that hit, but it was because I wasn't, I wasn't moving. I wasn't cycling. I wasn't walking very much. You know, I was just literally working from home, you yeah. know, and my fear for the future, and I mean this, is that people ignore the benefits of moving. And what I, be, what I mean by moving is not going up and doing a 20-mile bike ride or 20-mile run or whatever, but just go and walk to the shop. Yeah. Rather than jump in the car and, you know, like you live, what, one mile from the village? Yeah. Rather than jump in the car and, and say, oh, yeah, I'll just go and get some milk and bread and whatever, leave your car keys, go and do the walk. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because that 10-minute, that 12-minute, 15-minute exercise is improving the health of your muscles, your blood cells, your ligaments, your tendons. It's overall wellness, you know, and and just to finish on this point, I think, as I said, I'm 50 now, and I pump as much good food into me as I possibly can. Plenty of water. Thank you very much for supplying the no water. <laughs> um, but as much good food as I possibly can eat, you know, some great superfoods, you know, some brilliant botanical herbs, you know, um, but uh, but whatever you do, don't feed me sprouts. No, okay, that's... No. <laughs> what is that your is that your number one worst food? Oh man, honestly, I, I I'll, I'll never forget as a kid, my mother putting a cooked dinner out on a Sunday, beautiful chicken cooked dinner, lots of gravy and roast potatoes and you know parsnips, and I was like, oh yeah, here we go, and I started tucking in, and I took a mouthful of this, what I thought was cabbage, you know, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ma'am, what is this? Oh, these are these are sprouts, Mark. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so I, I think I was probably about eight, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. It, uh, unfortunately, for those sprouts lovers out there, apologies. But, yeah. Mark is it, not your man. <laughs> it's, it's definitely not one of my favourite, you know. Um, what's, your, uh, so. what's your guilty pleasure there, Mark, food-wise? My guilty pleasure? Um, We've all got them. Yeah, I, th- <laughs> I, th- I think it has to be probably Indian food. Yeah. Okay, to be honest with you. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and as I said, I've been lucky now the last, you know, sort of eight or nine years to have travelled the world as a speaker, um, as a, you know, a very proud Paralympian, which we'll come on to in a second. Um, 
and just enjoying, you know, some incredibly rich, spicy, you know, foods um, with some incredible different, you know, tastes that, that probably that, yeah, tastes that I never grew up with, you know, and I sort of discovered, um, you know, Indian food in my 20s, believe it or not. And, um, and I was like, wow. I like yeah. this. <laughs> this is pretty cool. So yeah, that's definitely one of my uh, w- one of my vices, you know. Um, so yeah, what about you then? Obviously, you know, switch the tables. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, more than welcome. Yeah, ask me as much as you want. Uh, I would say my favourite, which is probably a standard for a lot of people, would be pizza. I would okay. say as a yeah. as a general rule, and yeah. uh, even when I'm at the peak of diet for training for an event. I still try and sneak as yeah. <laughs> one or two in here. Yeah, just you've, uh, you've got to have it because you know if you don't have what you really crave, um, the the brain you know wants it more. It does, yeah. Know, if if, so. if I restrict myself from having it completely, I could fall off the wagon in many other ways. Whereas yeah. I feel if I if it's a plan as well and it's part of my plan, I can work around it. And, yeah. and I think that's a key for a lot of people is build it in balance. Build it in. It's yeah. all about balance, you know. Even you know when I was training full time with British Cycling, um, six days a week, you know, you have to have that one vice, you know, that that one thing that you, you've always loved and craved for in, in just a small portion, you know, and uh, and I don't mind sharing this with, with your audience, you know, my, my vice was Nutella. Yeah. Yeah, I was a big <laughs> Nutella fan, you know, and it's probably probably the, the most unhealthiest chocolate food out there, <laughs> I you know, <laughs> with palm oil and God knows how, how, much, how much sugar, but just that teaspoon, just that teaspoon every morning, you know, with my porridge and my bananas, <laughs> just to, just to say, okay, I've had it now. Yeah. You know, and then go out and burn it off on five hours on the bike, you know. I suppose you you can kind of warrant having a bit of that when you <laughs> when you're training for yeah. for the Olympics. Yeah, so, you can. Yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. So yeah, I think um, you know, for the the audience, you know, watching and listening, um, 2009 was was just the the, the turning point really because, I guess. I was, well, I was living in Cardiff, I was working in Cardiff, I'd been divorced about three years at that point, so I had lots of time on my hands, you know, I was earning, you know, good money, and um, and I'll never forget, you know, planning with the, the, the paragliding club to fly on the bank holiday weekend, which was uh, May 2009, so, you know, just over 11 and a half years ago now, and um, and we planned to, to fly down in Rossilli, which is the, the Gower Peninsula, for those people watching, you know, Google uh, Rossilli Beach, um, or maybe the Gower Peninsula, and there's a beautiful beach there. It's about three miles long, you know, a huge beach that we used to fly over, you know, with the with the club. Um, conditions they were perfect, you know. We had a probably 21 degree uh, sunny day, blue skies, glorious, uh, 12 mile an hour headwind, you know, coming in off the Irish Sea, you know, onto Rossilli. So conditions were perfect, you know. And uh, and we'd been flying all day, and then about five p.m., one of the the guys who was sat with us said, uh, "Should we go back up? You know, we've got about about an hour left before the the sun sets and the wind drops." So I said, "Yeah, okay, let's go." So we hitched the harnesses back up and launched the canopies, and then literally twenty minutes later, whilst flying across the top ridge, about forty feet above the ground, um, you know, my my paragliding canopy literally just collapsed. You know, the, the wind that was coming in, I flew into what they call a crosswind and uh, and the wind just, just blew the canopy, you know. So I'm 40 feet above the ground. The canopy just does a full collapse and I'm looking at the grass coming up at a rate of knots and there was a few French words, as you can imagine. Um, and yeah, probably within two seconds, I put my feet out in front of me and just this almighty thud, you know, yeah. as, I, as I hit the grass. Now, to add insult to injury... Um, the the actual uh, canop- uh, paragliding canopy reinflated, and I got dragged for probably about a hundred meters, you know. So fully conscious, fully conscious, and it was just like, yeah, just like being a rag doll in a washing machine, you know. Um, it, it's just yeah, it was horrible feeling, and then it finally stopped dragging me, and I'm lying on the floor looking up at the blue sky. Now, at this point, I'm in no pain, which was really weird. And I thought to myself, shit, that was close. That was really close, you know. And then I tried to sit up and I thought, oh, I must be stuck on something because I couldn't get my shoulders off the floor. 
And then I looked down my body and both my legs were severely twisted. And I thought, shit, they shouldn't, they shouldn't look like that. And then I tried to sit up again and I couldn't sit up. So I tried to turn myself into the recovery position just in case I was sick and I passed out. Yeah. You know, obviously went unconscious. And, um, and I thought to myself, why, why can't I feel my legs? That's really weird. Why, why can't I move my legs? Because my legs are just twisted. So I grabbed my left leg and I literally lifted it over. And it was just all limp, you know, as if it wasn't my leg, you know. And, uh, and one of the guys who was flying literally above saw me crash. And he looped down and he landed, you know, he unclipped his harness and he, he ran over as quick as he could. And I'm just lying on the floor staring at this guy. And he says to me, Jesus Christ, are you still alive? I said, yes, but I, I, I can't feel my legs. Because from my waist down, I'm completely paralyzed. And he says, let me just radio for the, the Wales Air Ambulance, mm -hmm. you know. So he gets on the radio and he radios straight away. And then obviously this guy who's fully trained, um, you know, sort of put his jacket over me and just kept me comfortable and kept talking to me. And, um, and the Air Ambulance, you know, the Wales Air Ambulance arrived in, I don't know, probably less than 10 minutes. You know, I'm lying on the floor, can't feel my legs. I can just feel my body getting colder, you know, due to the shock. And I could just hear this, duk, 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 which was the helicopter coming in. And this guy saying to me, Mark, you know, the, the air ambulance is here. You know, they look after you, they'll treat you. Just stay calm, stay awake, you know. And, um, and the air ambulance probably took about 40, maybe 45 minutes. So they, you know, they, they stabilized me, you know, with morphine and they put the neck collar on and, carefully placed me onto this spinal board and then he lifted me off to the hospital you know so I'll never forget you know that evening having a, a an x-ray and an MRI scan and being told by the doctor that night you know that I'd broken my back wow. and I'm lying in this hospital bed thinking to myself did he just say I broke my back really you know it, it's almost denial which is the first stage of the the, the, the change curve you know and I was like no, surely not. <laughs> yeah, surely not. You know, because I just didn't want to believe it. And then my parents turned up, didn't they? Oh my God! I thought, here we go. Now I'm in for it. And um, and just 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 being there that night with my parents, you know, um, just in floods of tears, because I just thought, shit, this is the end, isn't it? I broke my back. I'm probably going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Am I ever going to get out of this hospital bed? Who knows? You know. So, so yeah, that, that was a really dark time. Um, and then I, I got taken from Swansea up to Cardiff. Um, I had a spinal operation. So I had six titanium pins, you know, inserted into my back. Um, and I've still got them in there today, you know. So imagine when I'm going through the airports. I was going to say, they, yeah, they, 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 went through my head. they love me going through the security when I set the alarms <laughs> off, you know. So, um, so, yeah, 94 days on my back. Uh, no movement, completely paralyzed from my waist down. Um, suicide thoughts, didn't want to live, just thought, you know, just, you know, balls to this, just just end it, you know. And um, I'll never forget, it was probably, I, I, I'm just you know, assuming now and guessing, maybe three months in, and um, my parents came to visit me. And my parents live about an hour from the hospital. So they came in the evening and... Uh, usual conversation you know how are you feeling what are you doing you know blah 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 and um and they, they were so supportive you know so loving and so caring and then about seven thirty p.m my mum said to my dad who was still alive at the time um i'm just going to nip to the toilet and uh, and then we can make our way home you know because it's getting late you know seven thirty p.m so my dad said yeah okay so my mum went to the toilet and i'm lying in this picture the scene now i'm lying in this hospital bed the bed is up at sort of 20 degrees because they're raising me up, you know, literally uh, inch by inch every day just to sort of get some blood into my yeah. body. And, um, and my dad reached over to me and he grabbed hold of me by the scruff of the neck. And he said, you listen to me now. You stop upsetting your mother. You stop upsetting me and you pull yourself together. You listening? I shit myself. You can believe I'm it. I'm telling you now, right? I'm, now my dad was a gentleman. And he's got hold of me by the scruff of my neck. And he said, you listen to me. And I just started crying, you know, just started crying. I was like, oh, my God, you know. 
And he, he did this, and he said, no, you don't tell your mother we've had words. You keep it to yourself. You listening? Yeah. So here comes my mother now. You ready then? <laughs> yeah, okay, see you tomorrow. I shit myself. I thought, I thought he was going to punch me in the face, you know? But what he did was he took me out of that mindset do you know what I mean? He, I was going to say, I, yeah. I was feeling sorry for myself, you know? Was that what took you from the suicidal, depressive thoughts to... 100%. The path you, you, you got on? 100%. He knew that, you know, I just wanted to... You know, we spoke about euthanasia. We spoke about suicide attempts. You know, I said to my dad, and just, you know, I just just get it done. God, that's, a, that's a rough place to be, Oh, mate. I'm telling you now. a rough place. He, he, he caught hold of me, and he said, you listen to me now. And I was like this, <laughs> you know, and I, I couldn't go anywhere, could I? You know, because I'm stuck in this hospital bed, you know, my legs not working. And um, and and never forget him saying to me, you're going to get through this because you're a winner. I was like, oh, wow, tears. You can imagine yeah. just floods of tears, you know. And um, And yeah, he was right. You know, he was right. So my mother never knew about the conversation until many, <laughs> many years later. <laughs> so he actively... <laughs> Pulled you out of the hole of the self pity that you hundred percent imposed. You know, I yeah, because was in a dark place. Understandably, place, obviously, you know, but yeah, mate, but, um, I can laugh about it now. Unfortunately, he's not here, you know, just to enjoy those laughters with us. But um, yeah, I can only thank him because he was a he was a gentleman. You know, he really was helped yeah. shape yeah. shape your life. Yeah, yeah, he really did. Yeah, it, it takes a very strong person to even uh, to not. I say buy into it, but like buy into your pity because you're, you're in such a terrible place with what happened. 100%. Uh, I think for anybody going through, you know, any trauma, um, you know, any mental health issues, you know, um, my, my only piece of advice, my one piece of advice is, is just reach out. Just speak to people around you, your support network, your raving fans, your friends, your family, your neighbours, you know, people that will just give you time just to listen and talk, just to understand how you're feeling and what you're going through, just to share that empathy. It is that, know, that, that old saying, can share yeah. the empathy, you know. Problem shared is a problem halved, isn't it? 100%, and, uh, 100%, you know. So, so yeah, um, six months in hospital, you know, I finally left hospital then after, like I said, six months on crutches, you know, learning to walk again with special ankle supports because my feet don't work because of spinal cord damage. Um, my calf muscles don't fire. You know, so my hamstrings don't fire, my glutes don't fire. So all of my movement was from my quads, you know, literally driving my legs forward and then obviously core stability as well. So um so yeah, that was that was the beginning of the future, I guess. Yeah. You know, hundred percent. So one life to the next. <laughs> how how have you got yourself to the position now? Obviously you, you can walk now, Mark. How how did obviously a lot of rehab and stuff. Um Without yep. their muscles firing, how how do you find it? it do you know what it, it was in the beginning? It was it was difficult, um, and and even though I'm not a tough cookie, I feel I've got a, a a warrior mindset. And what I mean by that is that my 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 late dad used to say that I never had a stop button, and he he had a point. <laughs> he really yeah. did have a point that I, I I don't know what it is. You know, I've never taken no for an answer. I've always said okay, let's do it. You know, like I said to you when we, you know, when we messaged, yeah, yeah. and um, and and life's all about the about living because the two things to take out of this for me personally, this this incredible life, is my dad saying to me when I was about ten that one day in the future, tomorrow will be your last day. Just let that sink in. One day in the future, tomorrow will be your last day, whenever that day will be. You know, for everybody watching this, I hope it's. You know, many, many, many years for everybody. Um, and when I was 10, the penny dropped and I was like, I get it. Yeah. I get it. That. It's not forever. You know, it's going to stop one day. And I think then when I left hospital, I still had that mindset that I've got to enjoy the experiences, the memories, the friendships, you know, around what life can give us. Because that's what we take with us to the grave. Everything else, the car, the house, the shoes, the watch, the holiday home, we hand all that back. Yeah, we so do. So we only yeah, borrow it means, it. it means nothing. We only borrow it. Enjoy it. I'm not saying don't enjoy it, but enjoy it. But don't ignore the fruits and gifts of life. Friendships, people, 
experiences. Yeah. Because that's what we, we need to fill our life full of, you know. So so when I left hospital and I started, you know, just getting myself fit and healthy again, um, I went back to work for a little while part-time, but I was just being authentic and honest with myself because it was really difficult trying to get about with this you know, disability. Literally only probably 40% of my legs work. So to try and get about was really tough. You know, I've just spent six months in hospital, so I, s- I certainly wasn't fit. What, what did you, you know? do before, Mark? What was so your job? I was a senior accounts manager. So normally, you know, sort of sales and marketing, um, you know, with customers all around Wales. Great job, loved it. You know, obviously, you know, sort of high sales targets, etc. Salary, company car, you know, all the bells and whistles. But for me, it was all about, it was all about getting well, getting healthy, getting fit again. Because I knew that if I could get myself fit and healthy again, then I could start living my life again, yeah. albeit with a disability. And there's um, a very famous, um, you know, a very famous um, saying, you know, with regards to the change curve that. The quicker you can accept change, the quicker you can move on. Okay, don't sit in pity. Don't sit and and wallow in pity. Just accept it and move on, you know. And I think I moved on pretty quick to start cycling again. I went back to the gym. As I said, I gave up my job because it was just too much, you know, physically too much, emotionally too much. And and I just wasn't over it, you know. And uh, and thanks to an amazing... A uh, guy in um, in the Newport Velodrome, the National Velodrome in Wales, um, wonderful volunteer called Neil Smith, and Neil Smith is a cycling volunteer. He's a cycling coach, and what Neil has done for gosh, probably the best part of I don't know, I'm, let me think, twenty years maybe. You know, um, he's been helping disabled athletes, male and female, all different disabilities, to to participate in cycling in the, in the velodrome. What a bloke, you know. And he gives up his time. He works full time. You know, he's got a high profile job, and um, and he's actually formulated ex world uh, world cycling champions, Paralympic champions, world record holders. So he gets them to the point where they're good enough to then hand them over to British Cycling. So so Neil is a facilitator, basically. Yeah. Okay, he's like a talent scout, you know. And I'll never forget meeting Neil, and um, and Neil saying to me you know, about my disability and going through, you know, obviously w- which muscles worked, which muscles didn't work. And uh, and I said to Neil, look, I, I've ridden a bike since I was about five. So riding a bike is easy. It's just doing it with this disability, you know. So we worked out how, you know, I was obviously going to ride with this disability. And I'll never forget Neil bringing this bike out to the storeroom one day with stabilizers on it. And I said, whose bike is that? He said, that's yours. I said, I'm not getting on a bike with bloody stabilizers yeah he said that's okay mate he said i'll put it back in the storeroom then i was like oh okay suck the ego in (laughs) so chuck it out the door and that exactly yeah chuck it out the door so so i started cycling in the velodrome with this track bike with stabilizers you know and uh and did it for a few weeks until i suppose i was competent enough so neil could then take the stabilizers off you know imagine if you didn't it's just, it's just crazy, all these things, these turning points in my life, where if I'd said no, you know, what if I didn't go to the velodrome? What if I just went back to work? I can't do it, I can't do it. Yeah. But just, you, you did. So I think then, for me, it was, you know, just training regularly, doing a bit of cycling on the road, you know, the odd 10, 15 miler. Um, I used to cycle just up the road here, actually, not far in uh, in Abergavenny, um, from the Hardwick pub. And... And just starting to deal with my disability, deal with the trauma, you know. And, and don't get me wrong, I went through the apprehension. I went through the, the fear, the doubt, the uncertainty that we all go through when we go through change. You know, like this bloody pandemic we've just been through. The whole world was put through those four pillars, you know, of change. So, so yeah, so when I started cycling, you know, with a disability, I started enjoying it. Um, my disability didn't bother me then, you know, if I'm honest just sort of got on with it really and um and then neil said to me one day i'll never forget um which was i think it must have been december um december 2009 into the yeah into the the january period and um he said look in a few months time we've got um a, a race you know in the velodrome an international cycling race obviously indoors and uh, would you like to participate oh, brilliant i said yeah 
you know, I've always had that competitive edge, you know. So I raced in two races, um, which was the Kilo, which is four laps of the velodrome, and then the three-kilometre pursuit, which is 12 laps. And I won both races, and Neil was like, oh, that's amazing, well done. You know, fair play, you've, you've, you've been amazing. You've done really, really well, I'm really proud of you. So the first thing I did, stuck it on Facebook, yeah, you know, yeah. as you do. And um, you can imagine the year that I'd just been through. You know, broke my back. You know, give up my job, and now I'm winning cycling races. Just from crazy, that you know? point to that point, before you go even further, is an amazing achievement. T- Twelve months was mental. You know, it was crazy. So I'll never forget then putting this, um, you know, these um, two wins on Facebook. And the guy who treated me on the day of my accident from the Wales Air Ambulance is a wonderful guy called Ross Griffin. And if you're watching this, Ross, you know what I'm going to say. Thank you, okay? Because the guy saved my life basically. You know, that afternoon. So he, he rang me up and he said, oh, he said, I've just seen on Facebook that you've won these indoor races. Well done. Congratulations. I said, oh, thank you ever so much. How's the family, you know, general conversation? And he said, well, in a few weeks' time, he said, we, we're participating in a, a charity cycle ride for the Wales Air Ambulance. Would you like to join in? I was like, yeah. Yeah. 100%. These, you know, this organisation saved my life and I want to give back. A great cause as I well. I want to give back. So close to your heart. Yeah. So, um... So I said, so when is it? And he said, oh, it's about sort of four weeks' time. Um, and we're cycling the circumference of Wales. I said, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, it's 523 miles in a week. It's not too bad. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, what? And I thought, do you know what? I've got to do this. I don't care if I end up just doing day one, day two. And then I, I have to give up. Physically, I have to give up. I've got to do this. So... <laughs> So the first day was from Cardiff to Landridnod Wells, 84 miles. That's a trek. It's a trek in a car. It over is. Over the Brecon Beacons. <laughs> and I'd been only riding about 50 miles a week, 60 miles a week at the time. I wasn't doing very much. So I thought, I, I'm going to do this. I'm really going to do it, you know. And that's when the warrior mindset kicks in. And we all have it. We all have it. It's, it just depends on how deep you need to go to go into survival mode, you know. So anyway... So we finished the first day, we're in the, the rugby club all having food, just had a shower and a sports massage, just chilling out, you know, for the evening. Excuse me, and it was an amazing day, met all these famous people and it was just wonderful. And I'll never forget having food, and I received a tap on the shoulder and I turned around and there's a guy stood behind me, he's about six foot one, he must have been about 19 stone. And I hadn't seen this guy all day. I didn't know who he was, where he came from, and he said these words to me. He said, excuse me, when you finish your food, I'd like a quiet word with you outside. And he walked off. I had the squeaky bum moment. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what have I done wrong? <laughs> you know. So I goes outside after my food and this guy says to me, uh, what's wrong with your legs? I said, sorry? He said, what's wrong with your legs? Because I'm on crutches. you know." So I told him the story, broke my back. I've got lower leg paralysis. My feet don't work. Hamstrings, calves, glutes, you know. And he's like, how the hell are you cycling? I said, well, my quads fire, great. My, you know, my hip flexors work, great. Um, I just can. I can push and pull when I'm clipped in, you know. That's incredible. So we spoke about my accident for probably about 20 minutes, you know, my disability, breaking, you know, T12 vertebrae, et cetera, et cetera. So after about 20 minutes, just about to walk back in, and he says, um, can I ask you one more question? I said, yeah, of course. He said, are you training for the London 2012 Paralympic Games? Now, this was June 2010. So we're two years before London. He said, the Paralympics? No. Why the hell would I do that? He said, I think you should. And that was it. Just a light bulb moment. And I thought, oh my gosh. What if? Yeah. What if I could train for the next two years and just get to London? You know, so long story short, completed the week. We raised 25 grand for the Wales Air Ambulance. Turned up back at my parents' house on a Saturday night. I'll never forget walking in through the door, giving my mother a big hug. You know, I'd obviously not seen her for the week. And, um, and my mother said to me, so how did it go? Did you enjoy it? Was it great? You know, I said, oh, mom, it was amazing. I loved it. I said, have a guess what I'm going to do next week. <laughs> What's that, Mark? I said, I, I'm going to start training for the Paralympics in London, you know, in two years' time. Oh, um, well, good luck. 
Uh, what would you like for tea? <laughs> <laughs> Just completely went over her head, you know? Was it uh, one of them crazy ideas she didn't think was going to happen at the time? Do you so, reckon? So here comes my dad. All right, Mark? Yeah, all right, Dad. Give him a big hug. How was your week? Amazing. Loved it. Brilliant. Met all these famous people, you know? I said, have a guess what I'm going to do next week, Dad? Oh, he said, I heard the conversation. What, what's all that about then? And I said, well, I'm going to start training. I'm going to speak to Neil Smith and you know, formulate a plan to get to the Paralympics, you know? Hmm. Mm. Come here. <laughs> so he called me over and he said, listen, you now. Go back to work. Just forget this Olympic, Paralympic dream you've always had since you was a kid. And just go back to work. Don't be so bloody foolish. Just go back to work. And I thought to myself, I've got to do this. I said, Dad, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to disagree with you because all my life you taught me when I was a child that if you have a dream, never give up. Okay, never give up until your eyes close for good. I said, I'm going to do this with or without you. I'm going to see and try just to see if I can get to the Paralympics. If I get there, great. If I don't get there, at least I've tried. Yeah. You know, at least I've tried. And uh, and I said, look, I, I've got to do this. Now, I said, you're either going to see me in London, flying the flag for Paralympics GB in Great Britain, or you're going to see me dead on the side for trying. And don't bet against me, because I'm serious. And he turns to my mother, he says, Margaret... Have a word with your son. I think he's lost it. (laughs) (laughs) And he walked off. So my point then is, you know, like even when I speak at schools now and I say to the kids, you know, what if I'd listened to my dad? What if I'd gone back to work? The world of cycling would have never have known I existed, you know? And my mother said to me then, she said, oh, you've upset him now. You've upset him. But I just had to give it 100%, you know, just had to. No choice. I I think, Mark... uh I don't know about you and well definitely you actually it's usually the people closest to you I think they're a bit fearful maybe that you won't accomplish your dreams so they kind of maybe dig away at it and say ah oh, maybe you don't want to try that you try something a bit more achievable but you're living proof that it, it doesn't matter you you can do what you want to do and maybe yeah. sometimes not listening to the people around you is I, I think you need to listen for the right reasons yeah okay safety is paramount you know my dad was only looking after looking after my safety oh, know, I, I, because he knew that when I committed when I said yes there was no stopping me because I had to achieve a lifetime dream because think about this everybody watching this recording you know this show London 2012 was only going to happen once it was never coming around again in my lifetime you know yeah, so I'm, it was a case of well if I don't make the commitment now I'm going to miss the bus basically you know, so so yeah, it was a hundred percent commitment. You know, how yeah. how many years do you think other competitors usually train for that sort of event? Because two years to a lot of people seems like well, it is a t- is a tiny. Well, we had two and a half scale. years. Two and a half years from you know from the the moment I said to Neil Smith, um, you know, I I want to give Neil and his coaching a hundred percent commitment. And I'll never forget Neil saying to me, look, I just need commitment and honesty from you. Everything else will just literally pan out, you know, week by week. So I stayed in touch with Neil, you know, for a a year. Um, I took myself off to Crete, you know, literally cycling over the winter. um, And uh, and speaking to Neil every week by Skype back then, didn't have Zoom then. Um, And Neil gave me the, the training program that I needed you know, um, I had a, 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 I met a wonderful nutritionist who gave me advice on food, um, what to eat, what not to eat, you know, when to eat it, how much hydration, etc. And, um, and I'm so grateful, you know, for, for those people. So, so when I came back then from, you know, from training in Crete over that seven month period, I came back probably about, oh my gosh, yeah, probably about two stone lighter, you know, um, so I was then ready for Neil then to speak to British Cycling to say, look, I've got this guy, he's broke his back, he's a C1 athlete, which is my category, you know, in, in paracycling. And, um, and Neil said, I think you should come down and take a look because he's, he's pretty quick. Yeah. He's pretty quick, you know, he's got a big engine, strong legs, um, even, though only, even though only half of them work, but he, he's, he's a powerhouse, you know. And British Cycling, the head coach, a uh, gentleman called Chris, said to Neil, so where's this guy come from then? 
we, we've never seen him before. And Neil said, well, he's fell out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally. <laughs> literally. Literally, you know. So so British Cycling said, okay, we, we'll give you an opportunity over the summer of 2011. So I raced in five races, five international races in Spain, Belgium, Holland, um, Canada, and Italy. And uh, and I came back with five medals. Well, So British Cycling were like, hmm. This is interesting, you know, and I was literally, yeah, I was 41. Um, so in, in my opinion, age is just a number on your birthday card. Yeah, because, you know, there's not many uh, Olympic athletes starting out at the age of 40, is there? I know you had, you, you've had like a sort of pre-career, you're always into your health and fitness, but committing to that at that age, God, it just shows you, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. It, it just comes to show. You know, as I said, I've I've been very lucky to meet you know lots of incredible people all around the world, and um, and and if you allow your mind to think about your age, to think about how weak you are, to think about how old you are, what you can't do opposed to what you can do, you almost live. Yeah, you almost start to live a negative life, uh, yeah. or a negative lifestyle. Rather than waking up thinking, do you know what, I'm awesome. And that's not egotistic. That's just, I'm awesome. I'm good at what I do. Technically, every person watching this is a miracle. Yeah. That's the way I see life. How do you keep you a know? positive mindset through, through the times of struggle, especially? It, it, it's through thoughts. It, it starts with that instant thought when you wake up first thing in the morning. Be grateful. You know, every morning I wake up, I do my breathing exercises, I do my stretching for like 10 minutes just yeah. to get my body, you know, warmed up and up and running and ready for the day. But waking up, opening my eyes and saying just to myself, thank you, because it could be much worse. Yeah. Does that make sense? Could, and I think, I think people who have been there, people watching this who have been through trauma, through loss, bereavement, disability, you know, people. I know people who've had both arms and both legs amputated. Okay. Yeah. And and funny enough, the guy's name is Mark actually. Um, and if he's watching this, Mark Ormrod, you probably know. Um, high five to you, my friend. Uh, big respect. And you would never want to meet a happier, more friendly guy. You know. And yet, some people would look at Mark and they would think, oh, you know, poor dab, poor bugger. Yeah. And Mark's like, well, I'm here. I'm alive, you know, he puts his prosthetics on and gets on with life, you know, because it starts with that thought. You start thinking you're great, you become great. Yeah, positive affirmation. 100%, you manifest know, 100%. Your, manifest your life, innit? 100%, you know, and and the, the mind doesn't know any different. Does that make sense? Yeah, it only knows what you're telling it. 100%. But so... It's so important for people to realize that and hopefully take, you know, take stock because we now live in such a, I suppose, a time in evolution where if you listen to all the negativity around us, okay, you start to believe it. Yeah. Yeah. You start yeah, to believe it, you know. It, it's everywhere as well. Is it social media, the telly, the news? It's full of it's kind of programming you into being a negative person. 100%. And the last thing you then need is somebody that you know saying to you, yeah, your show's not very good. Yeah. Sorry? It's bloody brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Do you see what I mean? You've got to believe, like, you've got to believe yourself, haven't you? 100%. If, you know, it's an amazing show. So for somebody to then say, well, maybe it's not my thing, well, that's okay. Yeah. Neither is Sprouts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be someone's favourite <laughs> thing, couldn't it? Exactly. So I think going into that process... And committing 100% to London 2012, because I knew it was only going to happen once. I was lucky to have Neil Smith there with me every step of the way. The nutritionist, you know, Sue, if you're watching, um, you know, thank you. And just being grateful. And at that moment, I knew in my heart that whatever happened didn't matter. What did matter was making the effort yeah. to, to, to get there, you know. So September 2011, I raced in the World Championships in Denmark in the 10-mile time trial, and I, I won a silver medal, um, 32 seconds behind the, the, the actual Paralympic champion from Beijing. 
uh, a guy from Germany called Mikael Teuber. So to be 32 seconds behind the Paralympic champion, over 10 miles, after literally two years post-op, you know, post-op, Neil was like, yeah, we're getting there now. We're getting there now. We're close now. And British Cycling then gave me the chance then to go to, the, um, you know, to Manchester to, you know, train uh, full time, you know, live in Manchester under lottery funding. I'm so grateful, you know, to obviously the National Lottery, you know, for the funding they, they obviously gave us as athletes. And what that allowed me to do, it allowed me then to train full time, as I said, six days a week, you know, have the best team around me, the best coaches, you know, the best physiologists, biomechanics, physiotherapists, strength coaches, yeah. you know, um, and the, the one important thing for anybody watching this who would love to aspire to be an athlete, my advice to you is quite simply this. Be open-minded, but be coachable. When somebody says, well, do this, do it. Yeah. Question it if you're unsure why you're doing it, but do it. Listen to the best. Do you know what I mean? I think so, yeah. You've got to take it from them. If uh, they've got personal experience, they, they're the ones in the know. Mm-hmm. You, you could go fumbling through it yourself but uh chances are that they're gonna they're gonna have what you need i was very grateful as i said to neil smith who took me from you know from literally leaving hospital to then you know start to cycle with a disability so much advice and help and guidance and support you know even now 11 years on i still message neil probably two or three times a week okay so to have that guidance to take me from this new disability to be in now a pretty good cyclist, you know, winning, you know, medals with British cycling in the international races, then taking the silver in the world championships. And then Neil knew in his heart, it's almost like, um, you know, leaving the fledgling, you know, fly from the nest, you know, um, to then hand me over to British cycling so they could then take me from good to great, you know. So, so yeah, that, that 12 month period, was just crazy you know living and training full-time in in manchester you know as a professional athlete was just a dream come true i bet i bet what what, what does that regime look like it, you know your weekly uh your weekly mileage it's um it's what i used to call a cycling prison <laughs> and i and i mean that with total respect anybody watching from british cycling you know where i'm coming from you, you're set into an environment it's a controlled environment because it has to be it has to be. It's very regimental. It's very structured because it has to be. Yeah. You know, you have to be eating food at a certain time. So you've got your two-hour gap, two-hour window then to do your training. Then, obviously, you have to have your afternoon power naps. So you, Really? Yeah. yeah, 100%, man. Because when you exercise, you know, if you do three hours on the bike, for instance, and then you come back, you have food straight away. As soon as you walk through the door, food, and then... Obviously, stretch with a, you know, obviously stretch in a foam roller in, then a shower, and then obviously you'd have your afternoon nap, because when you have your sleep after exercise and food, the body produces growth hormone, which means then that when you wake up, you have another snack and you're ready to do your evening session. Wow, yeah, I you didn't know, know that. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's all about this education, and then obviously back, same thing, food, shower, stretch, normally bed by nine thirty. Yeah. You know? And for the first couple of months, it was like, wow, this is amazing. I love this. And then after three or four months, it's like, oh, really? Same again. Same old, <laughs> same old. You know, it's like that TikTok moment, isn't it? You know, on the, on the clock, TikTok, TikTok, like the hamster wheel. But I, I thoroughly loved it. I definitely am not complaining. I absolutely loved the experience. The people were wonderful. The environment was incredible. And to be training, you know, twice a week on the velodrome, with the Olympic team, you know, with Sir Chris Hoy, you know, yeah. Vicky Pendleton, you know, it's just incredible. Like the Paralympic athletes that were there, Jody Cundy, Darren Kenny, you know, all these incredible, you know, athletes who won, you know, just a haul of medals. You know, Darren Kenny. Darren, if you're watching this, lots of love, my friend. Six Paralympic gold medals. Yeah. The guy's an icon, you know, and I'm training with all these people. And it was, yeah, it was just a wonderful, wonderful memory. You know, the dream come words. true. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So then, over the winter of two thousand eleven into two thousand and twelve, obviously we we're prepping, you know, for London twenty twelve. 
And uh, and unfortunately, my dad uh, had contracted stomach cancer, you know, through that uh, that period over the summer, and that was that was really traumatic for us as a family because I'm living away from Manchester, you know, I'm literally two hundred miles away. So going home, you know, sort of once a fortnight, once every three weeks, sometimes, you know, to see my parents, um, and obviously see my dad and well, and my dad was known as Mister Nice Guy because he was a he was a true gentleman, you know, so. To see him ill, to see him unwell, you know, in the last years of his life was was heartbreaking, you know. Oh, yeah. So that for me was going through another stage of change, you know, after the trauma of my accident. So, um, and then when I got selected for the the World Track Championships in Los Angeles, which was February two thousand and twelve, that was a, a turning point for me because if I medalled, that meant I was on the radar for London twenty twelve. Yeah, you know because. I suppose British Cycling don't select bronze or silver medalists. They only select potential gold medalists, you know, for the lottery funding, you know, because obviously that's where, you know, where the funding comes from in winning the gold medals, you know. So so to go to to go to Los Angeles and race in the World Championships, represent my country was a privilege. And fortunately it was the same time as my dad passed away when I was away from home, you know. So oh, that was a tough time. I was really heartbreaking. Really heartbreaking, you know. So imagine, th- I'll never forget, it was a Thursday morning, 9th of February 2012. I'm in the room, sharing a room with um, a guy called John Allen Butterworth, one of the other riders. And my phone goes, mobile phone, says "Man, mobile, you know. So obviously I picked the phone up and my mother, you know, was, was very quiet on the phone, you know. And she said, oh, are you sitting down? And I just knew. And I said, yeah, yeah, well, what, what's wrong? And she said, oh, dad's passed away in his sleep okay. this morning you know, um, peacefully, which is a blessing, you know, a, a real blessing. But to see him go so quick over that six-month period, you know, it just happened so fast. Um, so, yeah, it was heartbreaking. And literally that afternoon, you know, floods of tears, talking to my coach, who was a, a wonderful gentleman from British Cycling called Tom Stanton. So, Tom, if, you, if you're watching, hi. <laughs> um, big respect, my friend. And... Um, and yeah, just thinking, shit, how am I going to pull myself out of this one? You know, I'm racing tomorrow in the world finals. Yeah. You know, and I've got to deal with this. So Tom uh, called Professor Steve Peters, um, who wrote an incredible book called The Chimp Paradox. So if anybody's read The Chimp Paradox, you know where I'm coming from. So he, he rang Steve and he said, look, Mark's, you know, Mark's dad's just passed away. Can you have a word? You know, so he comes on the phone. First thing he says naturally is, you know, please accept my sincere condolences for the loss of your dad, you know, I'm really sorry. And I saw, thank you. And he said, look, I'm going to keep it short. Please understand that what you're about to do tomorrow will only happen once. The final that you're racing in for your country, for 63 million people, is only going to happen once. Do you, do you understand? I said, yeah. He said, so what would you like to do? I said, what, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, well, you've got three options. You can either stay there and not race, you come home, which means you don't get to race. Your dad's passed away. Do you understand? He's never coming back. Uh, yes. Or you stay and you race. I was like, okay. I knew that my dad would want me to stay. Yeah. I said, I'm going to stay and I'm going to race. He said, okay, good luck. Put the phone down. Whoa. I was like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> is but that it? <laughs> but there's no more to say, is there? No. There's nothing more to say. Just put it so bluntly. It's, it's like that moment. Pattern interrupt. Yeah. I was like, shit, he's gone. I said, Tom, he's gone. <laughs> so the next day I raced, um, you know, in the three kilometer pursuit and, um, and, and won, you know, won the, the world championships. So the, the jersey they give you is called the rainbow jersey. So it's got the colored stripes on the front. And I, I saw this jersey as a kid, you know, but didn't know what it was, you know. And all of a sudden now, after winning the race, I was in possession of one, you know. But I suppose for me, the heart, the heartache was, yeah, not not seeing my dad there, you know. Yeah, yeah which is really really tough. But oh, I can only imagine. And sorry for your loss, Mark. Yeah, it's, cheers, you know. it's it's tough, but I think I think you did the right thing, hundred yeah. percent. And that that bloke on the phone talking to you and pulling you into the situation to be able to do it is kind of. Take a couple of years back, that's kind of what your dad did to you in the hospital bed, really, isn't it? It's, it's yeah, definitely. So, yeah, you know, I'm very grateful to, you know, Professor Steve Peters, who was the British cycling psychiatrist, 
to understand what I was going through, but he knew um, it, it it had to be black black or white. Yeah, you know, make the decision. You come home, you're not going to see your dad because he's passed away. You know, or if you stay and you don't race, well, you've missed out, or you stay and you race. Yeah, it's a no brainer then, isn't it? And you know? if if you didn't do that race, do you think the road to the Olympics would have been would have been a possibility? <laughs> I don't know. I think looking back on it now, I probably would have just finished. You know, if if I would have been in that mindset, I think I would have just quit, just cut my losses, came home and forgot all about the games, you know. Yeah. But thanks to Professor Steve Peters, thanks to, you know, Tom Stanton and especially Neil Smith, because Neil, Neil knew my dad, you know. Um, so Neil was, yeah, Neil was a rock by my side, you know, he really was. Um, and obviously my mum, you know, that's what mums are there for, I guess, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, so coming home and then atten- attending my dad's funeral, which was horrible, you know, just a really sad day, memory I'll never forget. But I'll never forget my mother saying to me, so what are you going to do now then? You know, are you going to finish or are you going to you gonna carry on? Are you going to go back to Manchester? What are you going to do, you know? And I, I thought about it for probably a day and I just thought, well, you know, I know exactly what, what I want to do, you know. So I had to make a decision. So my mum said, look, wh- what are you going to do? I said, I don't really know. Because I was genuinely unsure, you know, in my heart. And she said, so what would what would your dad want you to do? I was like, where's my suitcase? I'm off. <laughs> Let's do it. So, so back to Manchester and then seven months of training. Um, you know, thousands of more miles on the bike. And... Um, and that, yeah, that, that summer, you know, the June, July, when obviously we had a Tour de France winner in Sir Bradley Wiggins, you know, we had the Olympics, you know, in London. And then, you know, in my opinion, the Olympics was a great warm up for the Paralympics. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it was just incredible. Just the, the epic summer of sport, man. You know, for people watching, if you remember 2012, we're eight years on now. But yeah, the, the memories are still very, very clear. Yeah. What a year. Home games as well. I bet you couldn't have wished for for a better year to take part. Really, that's my point. That's my whole point. You know, to to have the opportunity to race in the Olympiad is is a privilege, a once in a lifetime. You know, for athletes to race in two, three, or four games. Wow, you know, so many memories. But yeah. to have a home games, literally, you know, three hours up the M4 in my backyard, almost. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It was just, yeah, it was incredible. Just the, the memories, yeah, it was just the momentum. Yeah. You know, every month it was getting more exciting, more information on the news, etc. And um, just the atmosphere, man. Like a kid at Christmas, I bet. Unbelievable. And that's exactly what I use. I use that analogy when I speak professionally. People say to me all the time, what was it like? What was it like? You know, What was London 2012 like? And I'm like, can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Remember when you were a kid, when you were probably seven or eight? Yeah. Because we can, most people can remember back to when they're seven, eight, and nine, you know, as a kid, um, waking up on Christmas morning. I said, just roll all of those Christmases into one feeling. And then the feeling of waking up on your birthday, bank holiday, Valentine's Day, bank holiday, all those feelings, you know. Um, yeah, just a, a amazing memories, you know, amazing well, memories. On the day itself, how... As an athlete and a person, do you cope with all that excitement and anxiety? Because it must be huge. It's 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 very clever, which comes back to Professor Steve Peters and my coach Tom. Um, there's an old saying in 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 sport to think logically, not emotionally, because thinking emotionally won't get you a medal. No. Okay. Thinking logically will. So everything that we did with British Cycling, down to the meticulous planning. As I said, what time you eat, what time you drink, what time you start warming up, what time you start stretching. It's it's meticulous. Everything is meticulous. Planned right down to the last five minutes. Okay. And um and that's what puts you into this controlled environment where you just go with the flow. You just become a, a cycling machine. They you know? don't give you the time to think about all these like, external What what is there to think about? Yeah. Thinking about how many people are in the velodrome is not going to enhance my race. No. Okay, how many people are watching on TV? It's not going to enhance the race. So you have to go through that logical 
minute by minute process because if you do that will then give you the outcome so in other words don't focus on the process yeah okay sorry focus on the process not the outcome because if you do focus on the process the outcome will take care of itself you know and that's what the coaches and obviously the the staff at british cycling are fantastic at doing you know they really are so so to have that three month plan from literally you know june july and august every day was planned out you know where we were when we were training when we were resting eating sleeping stretching whatever 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 and and that process right up to the games puts you into the best condition you can be for that one week peaking peaking and mm. that's what they're amazing at doing so two weeks before the games i was exhausted i mean like i was shattered i mean just like sometimes too tired to eat my food yeah okay and I'll never forget my coach Tom saying to me when he said to me, "How are you feeling?" I saw Tom. I'm knackered today. I'm absolutely hanging, you know. And he said, "Great, great. You're on that's track. It, that's exactly where I need you to be." I was like, "Really?" So they call it an overload block. So the the month before a big event, you train to exhaustion, and then two weeks out, you start to back off. You're yeah. still training, but it's light training. You allow the body then to rest, recover, and repair, because that's when the magic happens. Yeah, when the body really peaks, you know. So to go into the holding camp, which was in Chepstow, in the San Pierre Golf Club, actually, um, training then at the National Velodrome in Wales, um, you know, for that two-week period of light training, mostly sort of high-intensity training, but not long endurance training. Because it's a long endurance that takes it out of you, you know. Whereas when you do fast, short bur- bursts. The body recovers quicker, you know, and uh, I'll never forget then getting on the bus, you know, to to travel up to London, you know, I can literally see the bus there now and going yeah. up the steps and in and seeing all the athletes. Great memories to have, mate. Mad man, you know. So, um, so yeah, getting to London was just incredible memories. Just the atmosphere, you know. The summer it was beautiful. August, you know, really nice um, sunny weather as well, and. Uh, yeah, and never never forget walking up to the velodrome and just thinking this is it. This is it, isn't it? You know, I've <coughs> I've waited thirty years for this, you know, to now being stood being stood in front of the you know, the most prestigious velodrome in the world probably. You know, the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Velodrome, otherwise known as the Theatre of Dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely was that for you, mate. Definitely yeah, just was. incredible. So to go into the games as a world champion, um, you know, it was a, a privilege. You know, it really was. Um, naturally, there's apprehension, fear, doubt, uncertainty, as I said. But I knew in my heart I was fully trained, fully prepped, mentally, physically, emotionally ready, you know, to to deliver my best performance. That's all you can do is give it 100%, you know. Um, you can't give it 99% and just try and wing it, okay? You have to give it 100%. And whatever was going to happen... I had to accept. Yeah. Does that make sense? So I raced in the kilo, which is four laps of the velodrome. I won a silver. Brilliant. Proud of my performance. I won a silver in the 10-mile time trial, you know, behind Mikel Teuber. He beat me by uh, by 12 seconds over 10 miles. 12 seconds, man. That's crazy, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, 12 <laughs> but, seconds is... You know, he was faster than me on the day, so well done, you know. But then as the world champion in the, the three-kilometer pursuit... You know, the 12 laps of the velodrome. As the world champion, I had the luxury of racing last. So the way it works is that uh, on the morning, all the athletes then uh, do their qualification rides, and then I ride last, okay? So that morning, a young lad from China uh, called Yang Zi broke the world record I- in my event, you know? How rude. <laughs> Cheeky. <laughs> So my coach said to me, look, you're going to have to break the world record now to get into the final, you know. I said, that's okay, leave that to me. <laughs> and, uh, and we set the schedule, and this, the, this young lad from China, the world record is now four minutes, 0.5, four minutes and half a second. So my coach said to me, look, you know, if, if, we, if we set it at three minutes 55, that will give you a five-second buffer. You know, you've just got to be within that window, you're in the final. I said, okay, let's do it. 
So I was the first C1 athlete to ever go under four minutes. Now, you probably won't remember this because you're too young. But for the audience listening, you'll remember Sir, Sir Roger Bannister, who was the first human being to ever run under four minutes for a mile. Yeah, I, okay. I probably know, know the, the name now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, now you've said So, So I, I actually broke the world record in qualification by seven seconds. So I smashed it out of the park, you know. And... Um, and come off the track, and I looked up at the scoreboard, you know, and it just said WR, just said world record, you know. I was like, wow, you know. What a, what um, a, and my coach said to me, uh, he said, uh, that was pretty quick. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but it, it, it felt easy because I was in such good condition. It felt easy, you know. I wasn't even out of breath, which crazy. is crazy, you know, but when I finished, you know. So anyway, it was 3 minutes 53.991, I think it was. So that meant then that I was into the final, and then obviously four hours later was the Paralympic final. You know, so that was the spectacle of my life. You know, amazing. So, so yeah, how do you go from obviously you got the silver, then the other silver, and then the gold? What sort of time scale is in between them races? Uh, well, between the kilo, uh, I raced in the kilo on the Thursday and took a silver, and then. The three kilometer was the day after, and then the ten mile time trial was uh, five days after. So you're within a week. Yeah, this is what you have to do. You have to be in the best condition possible just for that one week. Yeah, you know. So it's intense, isn't it? So yeah, so I had four hours um, to rest and recover, feed up, fluid, stretch, had a power nap, and um, and then literally two o'clock that afternoon, come back down into the velodrome. And uh, and start to warm up and do it all again, you know. Amazing. So so yeah. So for people watching, yeah, I was nervous. Of course I was. I'm human, you know. But I was trained not to be nervous. I was trained to follow the plan, follow the two o'clock down at the velodrome, quarter past two. You have your last drink, you know, your fuel of electrolytes and energy, and then you start to warm up because my race was uh, quarter past three or three o'clock, three quarter past three. Um, so you just start warming up, you just go through the plan again, start warming up, start stretching, you know, keep you know, obviously hydrating. And then three o'clock that afternoon, they called my name and number, Mark Colborn, Great Britain, number 42, which was my age, <laughs> which is mad, you know. Um, please come to the start line, we're ready for your, you know, for your final. And uh, yeah, I can just s still see it all happening now in front of me, you know. Did that performance from earlier on in the day give you an extra boost of confidence for that race? It, it gave me the confidence knowing that I, I still had more in the tank. Yeah. Okay. Um, even though I gave it, you know, I gave it the beans, but I knew in my heart I had to keep that 1% back to leave it all on the track then in the, in the final, you know. Um, so my coach Tom said, look, what schedule so, shall we set? And I said, oh, I'll just set it the same as this morning, Tom. I'm going to smash this out to the park, you know. Um, so he said, look, I've got one concern. This young lad that you're racing against from China, um, he's a sprinter, you know, and he's really quick over four or five laps. Now, this is a 12-lap race. So I said, so what's your point? He said, well, look, if this kid goes for the catch and he tries to catch you, if he passes you, the race is over. You're going on with the silver. I said, Tom, I'm not going home with no silver. <laughs> this is my race. I've trained all my life almost for this one moment, you know. And um, and we set the schedule the same as the morning, three minutes 55. And then obviously they took me up onto the track, parked the bike then into the gate, you know, compressed the, the brakes on, the, the um, brakes in the gate. And, uh, and then obviously I mounted the bike, clipped in my cycling shoes, looked over the track, and I could see that Yang Zi was obviously, you know, ready. And uh, and Tom said to me, um, do this for your dad. He said, are you ready? I said, yep, let's do it. So then obviously flag goes up and then the comma say, obviously the commentator then says to the, you know, the crowd is set, nearly 7,000 people in the crowd. The noise is pretty incredible, yeah. you know. And you could just hear this almighty shh. And it was this quiet, you know. And then the first beep goes off, which is the 12 second countdown. Beep. And then you're waiting, you know, gripping the bars, breathing deep as much as you can, preloading the pedal. 
and then you get the five second countdown. Beep, beep, beep. So you're watching the clock, you know. Um, but you don't press the pedal until you hear the B of the bang. So when it goes bang, the gun, right. that's when you push. You don't push before. No, no. <laughs> False start. Yeah, know? no good. So, um, so yeah, and I just came out of the gate, accelerated the first two laps up to speed, got the bike up to speed, you know, because I, I use a really heavy big gear, and um, and got the bike up to speed, probably hit about 30 mile an hour, and then it was time to hurt myself then. Fair play to you. I think, uh, obviously, at the start of the video, we've shown you starting out in your race, so I think this is a good point to flip back to that and show you... The second sh half. Show, show you the achievement, yeah, yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> and now Mark has reversed it by two-tenths of a second. The stadium roof has just gone up 20 feet as he now goes down the back straight and he's now work in progress. He's nudging it out to nearly a second. Well, in the city of Lamia Mark, he's a great pursuit, he'll know what he's going to do here, he shouldn't tire. I think the Chinese rider tried to go very, very fast on him, setting a much faster time than he did, it's now almost second half up in the first kilometre. But Mark knows what he's going to do, it won't be long, I think, before he'll actually have the Chinese rider in his sights. Well, let's get overconfident now, Neil, as he comes round into the two-kilometre point here. This is at the two-third distance now, and the crowd in front of me has always blocked my view as they all stand up. 2.35 for the second kilometre, and three seconds, I take it all back, Neil. He's got the rider in his sights. Yeah, I know Mark's going to do it. I know he can haul him in. He'll haul him in around about a second and a half a lap now. We really set a pull up on him. There he comes off that banking with a beautiful streamlined top pursuiting position here. Mark Coburn, 42 years of age. This could be the first gold medal for the Welshman. Bit of a surprise yes to him in the kilo, but he knows this is the one he wants. This is the one he came for. Mark Coburn, who broke his back in a paragliding fall when his ring collapsed and he fell 40 feet. That was in May 2009. In August 2012, he is about to become a Paralympic gold medalist. Look at him fly. There's, it might, he might not even reach it. Yes, it will, just about. He won't catch him in three kilometres. The bell has gone for the last lap. Yeah, the coach has given up on telling what schedule he's on. He's just pointing at the Chinese rider. Go and catch him. He's closing in rapidly, and he might just get on his slipstream as he comes off this banking into the finishing straight. He's 100 metres behind him as he lines up for the finish. The world record has just gone by, but he doesn't care. He, oh, my God, he hasn't! It hasn't! It's one... It's, oh, I'll have to work it out. It's about 11, 11 hundredths of a second. He's got the world record again. Incredible. What a way to win a gold medal. Setting them, you know, beating your own world record. You can't go better than that. Two world records and a gold medal from two performances today. Mark Coburn has got his gold in the best possible style. Right. What so do you think of that? Amazing. Pretty epic, wasn't it? Amazing, honestly. <laughs> when it, just watching it like gives me goosebumps. You know the way you've uh, you come back as well because you started off kind of is obviously part of the plan. I'd imagine, Mark's part of the sitting plan. back, but yeah, yeah. in the end, you just went off like a gun. I think, I think the important thing, uh, you know, for, for any cyclist or any sports person or business person, you know, is, um, is being patient. Stick to the plan, you know, follow the process, you know, focus on the process, not the outcome. And I guess, you know, to, to bring, you know, my Paralympic gold medal with me today, wow. you know, is, uh, you know, is, is a great... Check that out. Is, is a great, a great moment for me, you know, and, and I show this not, not to... Not to impress people, but to impress on them that, you know, even later in life, however old you are and you want to achieve, you know, certain things yeah. in life, that um, if it's been done before, then just do what's been done, but just do it better. Just do it better, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, an incredible journey. And, you know, obviously London 2012 was just a, an incredible historic part of you know of, of, of sport for the UK and yeah. the world through the legacy of 2012 you know to inspire a generation thanks for bringing that you in know. as well Mark no, it's, my uh, pleasure. it's amazing pleasure. It, yeah obviously we spoke a little bit before this and you, you went on the background of the medal so I wouldn't mind, do you mind just touching on it and you yeah. know telling us the symbolism behind it yeah definitely so so for the audience watching um these medals were the largest medals ever made for an Olympics or Paralympic Games. Um, 
the the purple, you know, the color uh, represents, you know, the the Roman emperors or the color of ro- you know, the royal colors. Um, then you've got the symbol, which is the Paralympic logo called the Agitos, and the Agitos stands for talent, ambition, and sheer determination. You know, which is the ethos of the Paralympic movement. You know, so. Mm-hmm. And these were made in South Wales, literally three miles from where I live. Crazy, which, which isn't it? Crazy, yeah. You know, it was meant to be. <laughs> possibly, it was meant possibly. to be. Possibly. So, so yeah, it was a great moment, uh, an epic journey. You know, from breaking my back to breaking world records, because then in the final, as the audience j- has just seen, um, to break the world record twice in one day was just epic. You know, and poor old Phil Liggett, who was the commentator, who says. Uh, uh, probably five meters before the line, you know, and Mark Holborn just about to win his Paralympic gold medal and the world records just gone by. Oh no, it hasn't! <laughs> it's broken it again. <laughs> I know that ending is such like a a weird place to be, isn't it? It's yeah, it's mad. So, um, so yeah, commentator's curse for Phil. But uh, if you're watching Phil, best regards. My <laughs> best regards. I think it added an element to it because it was like, ah, oh, yeah. yeah. So um, amazing. So yeah. So obviously, life then. You know, life after London being awarded the MBE, you know, by His Royal Highness Prince Charles. Just, oh, just incredible. How, how does that come yeah. about? Did you get a letter or is it a standard? Yes, yes. I, I received a letter um, about a month before Christmas. Um, so about two months, yeah, two months after the Games. And uh, it said that I'd been named in the, you know, the honours list um, to receive an MBE uh, in May 2013. So obviously it says in the letter, excuse me, it says in the letter, do not disclose this letter to anyone. Yeah. Okay, because of the embargo, you know. So when on January the 1st then, when it came out on, on the news that, you know, the New Year's Honours list included Mark Colborn, you know, Welsh Paralympic cycling champion, my mother called me. I'll never forget. And she's like, um, Happy New Year, because it's the 1st of January. So thanks very much, ma'am. You know, Happy New Year to you. How are you feeling? Yeah, everything good. Yeah, great. She said, I've just been told by John Simmons, who's her neighbour, that you've just been awarded the MBE. Is that right? I said, "Um, yes, actually. (laughs) She said, and why didn't you tell me? Damn, John. (laughs) I said, well, to be honest with you, ma'am, I said, the letter I had of the Queen said, you know, do not disclose this letter to anyone, you know. She said, I'm your bloody mother. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that's You should have told, told me, yeah. So. Every Christmas, I bet you get that in the neck now, do you? <laughs> yeah, so that was a great day. Take her to, tip, tip my mother and my daughter to Buckingham Palace. Um, yeah, the, you know, the most prestigious house in the world. Yeah. You know, um, w- it was a great day for her. You know, having, having lost her husband of, you know, 56, 57 years, seeing her son go through breaking his back. You know, my mum had breast cancer. So, you know, the whole family's been through so much trauma, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was it was her day, you know, to, Amazing. to see her. You know, oh, really yeah, happy, I you bet know. it was the proudest moment of her life. Oh, crazy. Yeah, it was great. Really good. So, so yeah, you know, life after London, I started speaking professionally and helping large organisations, you know, with resilience and mindset and communication, teamwork, um, and just being the best you can be. Brilliant. You know, and that's what it's all about for me is contribution, helping others. You know, and I've, I've been privileged to, gosh, travel the world. I've presented at 215 conferences. You know, I've been to Iran. You know, I've been to the Middle East. I've been to Tel Aviv. I've spoke all over Europe. Just a, an incredible journey. And for me, it's the, the proudest moment is knowing I'm doing the right thing. Oh, you are. You know? so I think to anyone who's watching this, uh, watch watching you anywhere else just to take from your story of how you can be in what's perceived as like the worst place you could be in to now coming through doing what you did with the olympics and now in the position you are spreading that message to other people i think it's, it's amazing and powerful it's important and um yeah it's really important for me because I, i'll never forget leaving the um the, the world-class cycling program and the gentleman who did, you know, the the interview when I left, uh, when I was in Cardiff, and uh, and we went through, you know, all the questionnaires about going back into, you know, obviously general life, I guess, from sport. And he said to me, "Can I ask you one last question?" I said, "Yeah, of course." He said, "What would you like written on your headstone?" Hmm. I said, "Well, to be honest with you, I I've not really thought that far ahead, you know." Yeah. But he said, "I'll give you a minute just to think about it." 
So I, I thought about it and I thought, wow, that's a really powerful question, you know. So I said, I've got an answer. And he said, okay, what is it? And I said, what I would like written on my headstone is the words, I know I made a difference. Wow. And he was like, wow, <laughs> okay, never heard that before, you know. And it's true, it's how I feel, you know, and hence helping you guys with this wonderful, yeah, thanks for coming, wonderful man, show. Yeah. And, you know, obviously other people that I help, you know, with, uh, with networking and, you know, creating a portal for people to reach out. Yeah, you know? yeah, you're... Uh, Obviously, you've got a lot of things you're working on at the minute. Uh, you alluded to a couple earlier. So you're starting this this new business, DigiMonkey. DigiMonkeys, yeah, yes. Yeah, that's wicked. Yes, my business partner and I, David Williams, um, we, we've had, um, well, David's had this uh, idea for a number of years now to create a, a website development, you know, a design company that um, is very different, you know, and DigiMonkeys in itself is completely off the wall, isn't it, you know? So, and that's what we do, you know, which leads on to what we do as a company. Um, we build off the wall websites at affordable prices for everyone, you know, whether it's a brand new business, you know, a, an entrepreneur, SME, you know, small, medium enterprise, or maybe businesses that just need a new website, yeah. you know, and, uh, and it's, um, it, it's a business with a twist because we will have, uh, we launch in January, 2021. So we are literally a few, you know, a few weeks away from it now. And uh, and what we provide is an academy, a DigiMonkey Academy for advice for small business owners, you know, because people who want to launch their business, they know what to do in terms of their product or service, but they don't know how to run the business. Yeah, Does marketing, everything's massive these days, isn't it? You know, d I, I spoke to a guy two weeks ago. He didn't even know he had to have an accountant. He was like, really? I was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um so all of the information, the foundation of what people are going to need to run a business from scratch, you know. Um, so we've got the academy. We've then got e-learning, you know, for, for the general public and uh, clients. Um, we've got courses, you know, online courses as well. Um, then we've got the, the business coaching where I come into it, you know, with one-to-one -one coaching and obviously group coaching. Um, and then we've got a, a special networking portal where we want to bring lots of small businesses together, okay, as a, as a framework. And, uh, and that's then going to be done through Zoom, you know, as well, so we can speak to people all around the country, you know. And uh, I suppose the, the USP for us is, is making sure that the CSR or the corporate and social responsibility is paramount. Yeah. Know, to, to give back to um you know to the organizations that are giving us the work to create this this business you know so so yeah watch this space uh digimonkeys.co.uk and uh january is uh, is the soft launch you know? it, i think it stands out as well you were showing me some of the designs and stuff earlier it's definitely uh it's gonna stand out from the crowd and i think you definitely won't forget it <laughs> yeah another usb unique selling point for you yourself is I don't know if you want to delve into it or not about the uh, affordability and, and how yeah. you're going to go about that. Yeah, definitely. So we're in a, a position where we can spread the cost, you know, so we'll give the clients an opportunity rather than pay up front, you know, they can spread that cost, you know, over a, over a period of time. So they get our support, you know, they get a health check every three months on the site to make sure everything's working. Um, obviously, the businesses that then want to join the academy and, you know, obviously then to join the courses, the mentoring business coaching so they get my support you know over that period of time and um and yeah we just want to give back and, and help as many people as we can yeah you know which is great and then through markcolbone.com they get the advantage then obviously of the the health and well-being aspect you yeah. know as well through the resilience training that uh, that i do you know that that i give to many businesses as well so so yeah we feel that we can offer a, a full package you know very different to ensure that we can create the lasting change Brilliant. That is one of your biggest messages as well, isn't it, Mark? Uh, yeah. What would be your number one advice now for a youngster looking to set out, follow their dreams? I think that the one piece of advice I would give any youngster, you know, if you want to pick an age, somebody under 25, okay, is to, is to, to find what you really love and do it because you'll never work a day in your life ever again, you know. Yeah. But it's hard to find something when there's so much out there. So my advice would be just go and try different things, you know, because you have time on your hands. Yeah. You can't when you're 70 or 60 maybe, 
because you're running out of time. But when you're young, you can just try everything and anything. Yeah. You'll, f- you'll find something that you truly love. You just need to go and try everything. Go and do everything, whether it's sales, marketing, advice, coaching, whatever. Okay, just go and try it because you've got time on your hands, you know. And I think that's, just to finish, that's probably something that I can honestly put my hand on my heart and say works. Because as a kid, you know, as a teenager, I did every sport. I participated in every sport that is and was almost to do that gave me the skills, the knowledge to then take on the games. Does that make yeah. sense? You know? Yeah, well, it's all building your character to get you to that place, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, life skills, man. Yeah. Life skills. You pick up you know? ev- every different thing you do, even if you feel like it was a negative experience, you still take things from that and carry it forward for the rest 100%, of your life. 100%. 100%. So, um, so, yeah, definitely. Just go and try it. Go and do it. You've got time on your side, you know. Um, yeah. And if I can win a Paralympic gold medal at the age of 42... Then yeah, almost anything's possible. <laughs> I totally agree. I totally agree. You know, so yeah. Well, I think we're uh, we're running short on time there, Mark. So we're gonna have to leave it there. But honestly, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. You've dropped some serious knowledge out there for people today. If people want to get in touch with you for the future, obviously you have got your business, Health with Mark, MarkColburn.com. Yeah. That- so if people want to go to MarkColburn.com. Um, then you'll find obviously there's a nutrition page on there as well with a webinar for people to watch. Um, you know, because as I said, I'm I'm a big advocate of health and well being because bar the sprouts. I bar the sprouts, <laughs> yes. Maybe unless they cho- unless they're covered in chocolate, maybe that's a, n- a different conversation, but that would be gross, <laughs> wouldn't it? I think um, so. So yeah, you know, please go to markcolbone.com um or you can go to healthwithmark.com and obviously it takes you to the same page. And then, obviously, January 2021 is the unveiling, the launch of digimonkeys.co.uk. We may have to approach you to get ourselves a website then. 100%. More yeah. than happy to help you. Definitely, yes. Brilliant. Definitely. Cheers, so, Mark. Yeah. Well, I wish you the best with all your future endeavours. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure you're going to come out on top. Yes, why not? So good luck, everybody. Thanks for watching. And uh, and please enjoy the next show. No Cheers, worries. Buddy. Take care. All the best. Thank you very much. See you.